An extra nine weeks. European leaders in Brussels granting Theresa May a Brexit delay, albeit shorter than the three months she requested. May 22nd is the eve of the European elections. At the date suggested by the European Council at a summit taking place in Brussels. There's a big if, however. If the UK Parliament finally decides on what it wants. Can the Prime Minister convince enough MPs to agree on a divorce deal they've roundly rejected twice? A third vote to avoid a no-deal Brexit could come as early as next Monday. In a rabble-rousing speech ahead of the Brussels summit, May pitting the people against a parliament that she says has proven its inability to seize the initiative on a compromise. We'll know soon enough if May's gamble of running the clock can finally pay off, if enough lawmakers can be pressured into choosing her deal over no deal. And if not, if not, we're really into uncharted territory with a discredited prime minister who under Tory party rules is safe in her seat until December from a leadership challenge and a divided opposition that may or may not try to trigger a snap general election. What surprise can we expect? And uh, what's next on the Brexit front today in the France 24 debate? Is it her way or the highway? Joining us from London, uh, Labour member of the European Parliament, Sebastian Dance. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much to Conservative member of the House of Lords, Peter Lilly, for joining us. Good evening. French Member of Parliament Jacques Marie Lossian is with us as well, member of Emmanuel Macron's La République en Marche party. Good evening. Thanks for being with us. And thanks as well to Catherine Mathieu of the OFCE think tank economist who uh, monitors things across the channel very closely. Welcome to the show. Good evening. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, an extra nine weeks to sort it out. And ahead of that extension, there was definitely the sense that EU leaders don't want to be blamed for pushing the UK over the cliff edge of no-deal Brexit, but also the sense that they're losing a bit of their patience. We can discuss and agree on an extension, if this is a technical extension, in case of a yes vote on the agreement we negotiated during two years. In case of no vote or no, I mean, directly, it will guide everybody to a no deal. For sure. So, Sebastian Dance, an extension, yes, but only a technical uh, extension. Your thoughts on Emmanuel Macron's words and on that May 22nd date? Well, I, I, I'm not surprised by the date, May the 22nd, obviously being just a, a day before the European elections start across uh, 27, certainly, countries, hopefully 28, but we'll see. Um, and uh, I am not surprised either at the hard line being taken to make that condition on the on the deal passing but i think it's very interesting to listen to the words of the president there he very clearly didn't rule out other options either um, now we'll see what happens but uh, my message i guess to the eu 27 would be a deal that has been defeated massively twice is a terrible terrible basis on which to proceed if it's forced through a third time under duress it simply won't last it will collapse within months and i suspect uh, that that would take us to a very difficult place indeed. What's going to happen then next Monday? Well, who knows? Um, I mean, I wouldn't have thought that the deal would pass. I mean, if, if I were advocating no deal, um, I wouldn't see any incentive to suddenly switch my support to the Prime Minister's deal because the Council is very clearly... Uh, the message from the council is very clear in, in saying that voting it down would lead to, to what I want. Um, incidentally, I don't want that. I'm being hypothetical. Uh, and if I uh, were someone uh, uh, who wanted uh, a different outcome, whether that be no Brexit or a softer Brexit, uh, then I would be listening very carefully to the words of Donald Tusk and others uh, saying that there, there might be a, what well, would be, a uh, emergency council session uh, in the event of the deal being voted down. So I think you know, basically, there's nothing to make either side uh, shift their position towards supporting the deal, not least, of course, the fact that the Prime Minister gave that speech that seemed to attack MPs for doing their job last night. I think that did far more harm than good. We're going to talk about that speech in a moment, but Peter Lilly, uh, you're in favour of uh, Brexit. Is this music to your ears that uh, we're, looks like we're now headed towards uh, perhaps a no-deal Brexit? Well, undoubtedly, the best... Uh, agreement would be to leave on 
continue free trading terms. But if that's not available, then leaving with uh, no withdrawal agreement is the least bad option. There's no doubt about that, uh, both politically and economically. What do you think of this May 22nd date? Well, uh, that's only available if the a deal goes through, which is very unlikely, I would have thought. I have no better insight into the detailed intentions of uh, 550 members of parliament. But on past experience, it's not going to go through. N not going and, to... And therefore, that date is irrelevant. The, the, sorry, the, the withdrawal agreement will not be accepted by the House of Commons on the basis of past experience. I agree with Sebastian on that. And therefore, the precise date doesn't matter very much. The precise... Because that only comes into a play, as I understand it, if the deal is agreed by Parliament, which is unlikely. So is the UK ready for Brexit? Yes, uh, it's <laughs> ready. And there's been a whole range of mini deals done between the EU and the UK on uh, planes, on lorries, on trains and so on. Uh, there's been a lot of arrangements made both at Dover and Calais to ensure the smooth flow of uh, transport in both directions. So most of the fears uh, aren't there. That leaves tariffs, which are undesirable. Uh, and, but we've announced what the tariffs are that we would apply to goods across the world, including Europe, if we leave with no free trade arrangements. And uh, we know what the EU's tariffs are. They would cost us a total of, or our exporters, a total of £5 billion. Pounds. Uh, as against the savings we'd make of about £10 billion on the net contribution we make annually to the EU. So we'd be in a position to compensate industries who are hardest hit. Jacques-Marie Lossian? Uh, I cannot agree with what, with what you said, because uh, during the campaign uh, two years ago, uh, thousands of lies were announced for from, from the Brexiters' side, right? So, and, and you are continuing to lie no, to people. Wrong. You are continuing to lie to people. Why are you saying the UK Absolutely. is not ready for Brexit? UK is not ready from, for Brexit, and UK will suffer from a no-deal Brexit. And a no-deal will not fix the Irish border question, right? So, uh, just an example. What uh, happened two or three years ago, two and a half years ago, will. was a denial of democracy for three reasons. The first reason is the referendum is not a binding referendum because it's not official, it's not completely right, legal. Right, we're beyond that okay. now. The Prime Minister has said it's time yeah. to, respe to respect what, was, what came out of the ballot box there. Yeah, but to respect what? Something that is not democratical. Why, one explanation is you had three million British citizens, member of UK, living in mainland Europe who were not authorised to vote. I believe these people had a right to vote for Brexit or not Brexit. They were not authorised to vote. Do you think this was a democratic vote? Obviously no. And during the campaign, the Brexiters made thousands of lies. Remember the NHS that could be saved by a, a Brexit. And they admitted the day after the vote it was a lie or they said a mistake. So. All along, you are explaining the British citizens that there is no problem. All right, but let, let's, get to the, let's get to the point here. Uh, you just heard Peter Lilly saying that uh, the ports, the, uh, they're already that, yes, they're, 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 they're it's going to be mostly tariff. It's going to be mostly tariff free. No, uh, we have. Uh, uh, no, I didn't say we, that. I didn't say that. OK, what did you say then? Uh, I, I said we have announced the tariffs Britain has announced the tariffs which will apply worldwide. So we'll cut and remove a whole lot of tariffs, but they will, of course, for the first time, apply sure. to imports from the EU. Yeah. So we'll, Our we'll exporters will our face producers. the common external tariff. Sorry? But, but so, the, if there is a no deal, uh, the day after, UK has to renegotiate more than 700 agreements. OK? Legal, administrative, uh, trade agreements and so on. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, Sebastian, dance. <laughs> yes. You, 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 well, we I, I mean, I agree entirely. Agree I agree that we have a civilised yeah. discussion and that we don't accuse each other of lying, as the previous gentleman did. Uh, I just don't think that's helpful. 
But well, when it I, is I, a truth, I mean, just, no, but maybe then, yeah, if, I if I may, to, if I may to, also to interject, it, <laughs> interfere. So, sorry, sorry. If I may uh, just, just, just very, yes, some, no, I, no, sorry. You, yeah. Yes, I would like to say that I don't really agree with you in terms of democracy. I think this was really a democratic exercise, this referendum. And I think our British friends are showing us that there is a democracy in Europe and that when there is a referendum, you have to uh, apply what has been voted by the people. The citizens who are not living in the UK for more than 15 years, all right, there were probably most of them were in favor of remaining. But there was a campaign, there were millions of people who voted, and I think this is a democratic exercise. And in terms of lies, here also, I don't really agree with you, because yes, the buses with these 350 million pounds that the UK was going to save, give to the save, uh, National Health Service. Yes, by, by week. NHS. This was not true in the sense that this is the amount which is paid by the UK. Okay, but but the UK gets also from the European Union money. So in net terms, it was around half of it. So this was not uh, right, exact it was it was from the, the okay, Brexit but, side. But, but let's get to the point in hand, which is right now. The but situation. to the point is in hand, but the point is that I would say that there, was, there is a withdrawal agreement which was, which was presented by um, Theresa May to the parliament. And the parliament, in the UK said no, twice. The Parliament also said no to a no deal. So there is a need to find another way, a third way of getting out of this thing. So I think probably today, mm. what the Europeans do in having these tough deadlines in terms of the 22 seconds, they, ha they um, take the risk that there is a no deal in the UK, which in fact nobody wants. So I think I'm afraid that the Europeans are too, ta too, um, too strict with the UK currently. Too strict? What should they have done instead? <laughs> I think for, for many months, the UK has said, well, the agreement, at least the UK Parliament, is not something we can agree on. And so there is a need to, there is this issue of the backstop, which is there, and uh, which is, I think, something very strong in the fact that the parliamentarian voted against the withdrawal agreement. And so if today uh, the European Union, Union remains strict on, there will be this backstop. I don't see any chance of a majority of parliamentarians in the UK saying, OK, we are going to vote it, for that. It, it, it's, Sebastian it's not, Dent. It's not just about the backstop. It's not just about the backstop. Um, so, I, I mean, first off, in terms of the democracy point, of course, people don't vote for a result just for the basis of that result. Nobody voted leave because they like the word leave. They voted leave for a number of reasons. Uh, and if those reasons don't materialise because of what happens through leaving the European Union, I think, frankly, it's absurd to carry on when those results, uh, the result of uh, leaving the union delivers something that's opposite to what was wanted. Uh, I think it's absurd to then carry on without checking first. But in terms of forcing a decision, I think that, that probably will be the effect of, of the deadlines that we've, we've, uh, uh, we've um, heard from the council in their draft uh, paper so far. But, I mean, let's not start talking about removing the backstop, which is there because of the Northern Ireland peace process. It's essential that you have uh, no border infrastructure between the north uh, of Ireland and the south of Ireland, because, of course, that is a, a part and parcel of the peace process. And, and that is the key uh, factor that, of course, the Leave campaign never, ever factored in, because I suppose they didn't think about it. There was an article today by a, a former Vote Leave staffer who said, frankly, we were ignorant of this issue, and I hold my hand up and say I'm very sorry. I didn't know that this was a big issue. But it is, and that's why the backstop is there, and it's why it's so essential. But I don't think the people behind me in the Houses of Commons, uh, in the House of Commons voted against the because of the backstop, that's a cover. They voted against the deal because they know that it would leave us subject to European rules without any say over them. But of course, hey, guess what? That's Brexit. That's what it always meant. And the realisation of that, I think, is now forcing people uh, to think very differently. And yes, people are changing their mind. I don't think it's the will of the people anymore. All right, the will of the people. The Prime Minister talked about the will of the people late Wednesday. Uh, when uh, she spoke outside number 10 Downing Street after a day conferring uh, with uh, the heads of uh, various groups, she pitted the people against Parliament saying, quote, you want us to get on with it and that is what I am determined to do. 
So far, Parliament has done everything possible to avoid making a choice. Motion after motion and amendment after amendment has been tabled without Parliament ever deciding what it wants. All MPs have been willing to say is what they do not want. I passionately hope MPs will find a way to back the deal I've negotiated with the EU. A deal that delivers on the result of the referendum and is the very best deal negotiable. Did, did she go too far when uh, she said that, Peter Lilly? Uh, there's been a, a sharp reaction from uh, members of Parliament. Even the Speaker of Parliament uh, himself uh, reacted at one point uh, this Thursday, telling lawmakers, you're not traitors. Well, certainly they're not. No, there was a very adverse reaction to what she said, which was, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, ill-judged, or I didn't have any foresight and I didn't know she, what she was going to say. It, it has had a, a negative reaction across parties and across different groups within parties. Uh, could I just disagree, though, with something that was implicit in sh what she said and, and what other people have said? Parliament did vote by majority that it would accept the deal if the backstop were removed. And behind that was agreement across the Conservative Party between both the former Remainers, people like... Um, uh, well, former Remainers and former Leave uh, supporters, that we could solve the Irish border problem without infrastructure on the border and without checks carried out on the border. How? Uh, and they met and they discussed with possible. officials and they... Uh, got broad agreement. Of course it's a uh, possible. We do that already, even though there are different duty rates either side of the border, because different the VAT rates either side, side of, of the border. border. But you, you are in the well, same... They don't, they have different different taxes. Taxes. One at a time, one at a time. So, sorry, sorry, there are two issues. One, what uh, do you have to have the same tariffs and the same taxes and duties either side? No, we don't, because they already differ and we deal with smuggling, which happens in uh, cigarettes, in drink, which is the main commodity traded across the border, apart from agricultural products, and so on, by administrative me measures and cooperation between the forces north and south. We don't need uh, border posts and checks on the border. Now, then there's the issue, supposing we have different standards for, I don't know what, uh, um, vacuum cleaners in, in Britain to help Mr Dyson from those prevailing in Europe. That wouldn't be checked at the border. Customs officials do not check uh, whether a vacuum cleaner meets uh, EU rules or not when it enters from outside the EU. That is dealt with by trading standards authorities within the shops and within the wholesalers. So you do not need checks at the border. And all three parties, the Irish government, the British government and the European, government, uh, European Commission, have given assurances that if there is no uh, withdrawal agreement, they will not erect border posts and will not carry out checks at the border. They will all do it by administrative procedures mm. and by cooperation between the authorities north and south. All right, I'm seeing disagreement on the face of Jacques-Marie Lucien, but we have to go to a quick break. Stay with us. What? You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and uh, we're looking at uh, what is the money time now. Uh, the uh, Brexit was supposed to happen on uh, March the 29th, an EU summit uh, saying, yes, there can be a technical extension until May 22nd, conditional on the UK Parliament, perhaps for a third time voting uh, on uh, the uh, divorce deal that uh, it, twice it's rejected, the last time by 149 votes, with us to talk about it from London. Uh, member of the European Parliament for the Labour Party, Sebastian Dance, welcome back as well to Conservative member of the House of Lords, Peter Lilly, who's also with us from the UK capital. Here in the studio, we're joined by French member of Parliament, Jacques-Marie Lossian of uh, Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche party and economist Catherine Mathieu of the OFCE think tank. Uh, before that summit uh, started, uh, there was still talk about some kind of cross-party solution. EU leaders met with Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn, who reiterated his support for a deal and hopes for cross-party dialogue. The previous day, he spoke on the telephone with the Prime Minister, but stormed out of a cross-party meeting when he saw, among, other, among those invited, 
Independent Group spokesman Chuka Amuna, a Labour Party defector. Sources tell The Guardian newspaper that a cross-party attempt to submit an amendment to uh, that debate calling for a long delay to Brexit collapsed after it emerged that Labour's leadership was not prepared to support a lengthy extension. S Sebastian Dance, would you say that uh, Labour sh shoulders as much responsibility as the Conservatives for the indecision we're witnessing in London? Well, I mean, they don't shoulder, we, I suppose, don't shoulder the same amount of responsibility as the Conservative Party for this mess, certainly. But I, I am um, uh, disappointed, certainly, by the direction that, uh, um, th that we are or, or, or in some cases are not taking on some of this. Um, first of all, if we're going to have a different approach to Brexit, and let's be honest about what May's deal, what the deal before uh, the, uh, what the withdrawal agreement is, it is a very hard Brexit. Um, it would uh, cause economic distress to this country for many, many years to come without any of the associated so-called sovereignty benefits that, uh, um, that so many people who voted leave thought they were going to get. Um, so that is kind of a hard Brexit already. So if we're going to soften it, um, we can't do that in eight days. We need more time. Uh, we certainly can't do that before May the 22nd either. So I would like um, the Labour Party to also say, look, we need a long extension if, we, if we're going to uh, have a softer Brexit than this. And yes, people like me will continue to argue that there is no better deal than staying in the European Union. But let's be honest, we can't sort, sort, sort this out and get a new consensus in the time that we have available. So it seems to me obvious that if you're going to have a different approach to Brexit, you're going to need more time. Um, and I don't understand why we would restrict ourselves and put even more arbitrary deadlines on the process for, for arriving at a different destination. How do you explain the divisions within the Labour Party itself? Good point. Well, I mean, you know, for, for some people it's difficult because, of course, you know, I'm lucky. I represent London. London voted to stay in the European Union quite convincingly. Um, and, you know, it's, it's easy for me to say, let's stay in the European Union because I think it's the best thing for the country. So I've got my personal conscience and I've got my electorate uh, in the same place. Great. But for many of my colleagues, it's not like that. They represent seats that, uh, that did vote to leave. Now, I'd say in response that most of the Labour voters voted remain, and that's been shown consistently in poll after poll. But, you know, I do appreciate the difficulty that they have. And I think for some people, their conscience and their electorate uh, are in two different places. Um, I would tentatively suggest to my colleagues that actually, if you show leadership in terms of what uh, you think is best for the country and what you think is best in terms of the jobs that are available in the areas that you represent, then we can move the electorate uh, to a place uh, which is, is more in line with, with, with what we as Labour Party uh, uh, people and members believe is the right direction for the, for the country. But I know it's a challenge, and you certainly can't do that in eight days. What we need simply is more time. All right, so Peter Lilly, we're looking at that vote that could come as early as next Monday, a third time around for uh, taking a look at the divorce deal. Uh, how, how good are you at counting heads uh, when it comes to parliamentary votes? Uh, not terribly good, but <laughs> I have it on uh, from talking to colleagues down the other end of the building in the House of Commons that uh, the only sign of shift since the last vote is one or two people who previously had shifted in Mrs May's direction now hardening back. Uh, and there were, she had in last night uh, many of the 40 people who had shifted in her direction uh, and they were almost unanimous in telling her that now they would prefer to leave with no withdrawal agreement rather than continue on her probably doomed attempt to get her withdrawal agreement settled. Today's so, Thursday, though, uh, and uh, some of them will actually. S today's Thursday, uh, we've seen the pound. The, the pound has started to fall. That must be concentrating the minds. What uh, between now and Monday could those forty votes and uh, well, what are we talking about? Another hundred and ten shift back, and where would she get those votes? Well, seventy-five would have to shift back, I think, so, uh, to for her to win. I, I just don't see that happening. Where would she get them, those votes? Uh, on the pound. Sorry. Where would she get uh, the votes? Where would, could, she, would get she get them? Would she get more from the hard Brexiters or more from Labour Party supporters? Well, she'd obviously hope for a mix of the two. I just don't see her getting either. The, uh, 
the, what you call the half Brexiters, i.e. the majority of the Conservative Party, uh, who were merely fulfilling the promises they made to the electorate to implement the referendum to try to leave the customs union and the single market uh, and to do so as speedily as possible, um, they are unlikely to change. Uh, some of them might, if she somehow finds some way of tempting them. But the Labour people who might, in some circumstances, be tempted to support her deal from seats which have a large uh, leave majority, and they just want to be able to say to their voters, well, at least we didn't stop us leaving, uh, they will only do so if they're sure that the measure is going to be passed, because they don't want to look stupid as having sort of broken with their own party but failed to get the second best solution which they think uh, this deal passing would be. What I don't understand, and perhaps I can ask Sebastian, is what the Labour Party see as wrong with this deal, other than, of course, it's not remaining in the European Union. It keeps us in the customs union. It makes us subject to uh, single market law. No, it doesn't. Uh, it, in his view, oh, it does. It, that's the agreement. Uh, there are 140 pages of it. Doesn't, of it doesn't, no. It, it's, it's laws it's that we have the, to it's follow. It's not the customs union. It's not the customs union. I mean, well, you know, if we, if we were simply it's kind of leaving and, and in the customs union and, and the single market, then, you know, there might be some sort of case for it. Obviously, what would the point of that be? Uh, but, you know, there might be some case in terms of it limiting the damage to the economy. But, you know, it has all sorts of things in it. For example, in financial services, which, of course, is a huge part of our economy, uh, we are basically subject to the uh, approval of the EU27, to, uh, whether or not we can get the equivalent of passporting rights for financial services. Services. And that notice can be withdrawn uh, with just 30 days at notice. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is a catastrophic uh, basis on which to base our economy. Now, I'm sure Peter and I would agree on that. But, of course, we need the access to those passporting no, be rights because they are the very <laughs> thing on which, uh, on, very thing on which uh, a vast quantity of our financial services are based on. Of course, more euros are traded in London than any other financial centre in Europe combined. Now, Please. we can only do that because of the rights that we have as members of the European Union that we are trying to replicate through 585 pages in this withdrawal agreement and failing miserably. So that's why the Labour Party can't support uh, this, uh, this deal. It does nothing on workers' rights. It does nothing on environmental protection. It is clearly substandard to staying in the European Union. But as I said at the beginning, that is the reality of Brexit. And people can finally see now in a 585-page document exactly what Brexit is. And you know what? Nobody likes it. We get Catherine yes. Mathieu. Oh, mm. Well, I agree. Yes, I, I don't like it. I still don't understand why the Labour Party, which, uh, not Sebastian, because he was had a different manifesto when he was elected to the European Parliament, but all Labour members of Parliament were elected on a manifesto promising to implement the referendum result. Now, they want to do that, but so still you saying voting uh, against... have us linked to the EU. So, hang on. Have, having, they still want a, a customs union, they say, and uh, to follow European single market laws. That is what the Prime Minister deal's deal does. It keeps us in those things. Uh, we could, of course, break loose if we we're prepared to give up Northern Ireland and just leave it Northern doesn't. Ireland in a customs union and the single market. I'm afraid it does. All right, Catherine Mathieu. Uh, it doesn't. I mean, I've just given you one example in financial services where it clearly doesn't. I mean, there are many, many other examples of how it doesn't replicate being in the single market or the customs union. What it manages to do is no, try and get us some of the benefits it. of no, being no, in the customs no, union no, no, and the single market we have left whilst the European taking us Union. out. So exactly. we don't have any of the security we have now. Catherine Mathieu, at this it's point, yes, point maybe I would distinguish say between staying uh, maybe... in the European it... Union, which the Labour Party <laughs> promised not to do, but Sebastian wants to do, uh, and leaving the customs well, union and so the most, ceasing so to the be most subject to, to the polls, single market rules. If, if no, I, let me bring, let may, bring in Catherine Mathieu. Catherine Mathieu. Uh, Catherine may, Catherine may, yes, thank you. If I may put things maybe a bit differently, is that the British people voted in majority to leave the European Union, but nobody had an idea of what kind of Brexit it would be like, and there is a strong division among the British themselves about what form Brexit should take, as the two speakers right. just showed. I and have what a I. And uh, what I would like to say is that the withdrawal agreement doesn't address the long-term relationship between the UK and the European Union. It does address 
The exit. Three points, yes. The, exit. the withdrawal, so the rights of citizens, the financial bills with the, which the UK has to pay, and this famous uh, backstop. And then, if the, the deal is voted by the Parliament, there will be negotiations to start about what kind of relationships in terms of financial passports and so on. So nothing is settled in terms in, of the long-term relationship. And here we may be, I think, a bit uh, worried for the British because um, the conditions in which they are currently in the European Union are probably the best ones the best ones for them to deal with the European Union. So all the other solutions in terms of economy will be less, uh, than, what they have now. Advantages. less, less advantages than now. Jacques-Marie Jacques Lossian, you say you have a, you have a, I have a, a cross-party uh, compromise to, yeah, to suggest? Uh, uh, let's say that we are in a, in a civilized country and a civilized continent. Uh, obviously, it appears, uh, uh. It, it appears that the British people have voted for something they were totally ignorant of all the consequences. They voted Brexit, but when Please they voted... Please don't call my countrymen ignorant. They had a long referendum. It sir, was passionately sir, sir, followed. Sir, sir, I voted. I please, please. You have just insulted 17.4 million no. people. And no. I think you should withdraw that. You said they're ignorant and stupid. They are not no. ignorant. They took no. a passionate interest. I debated every day. The meetings were massive and full, and people were highly articulate on both sides of the debate and very knowledgeable. And uh, they so, 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 still think that we can just solve the Northern Ireland the border problem, uh, problem with technology. So, uh, so I've been visiting no, UK. No, technology by administrative procedures. Uh, I've been visiting. I've been working in UK. I've been visiting UK every <laughs> every quarter at least. I've been member of the commission for the negotiation of the Brexit. I was a member of the commission in the French Parliament for voting the ordinances for uh, exiting for the exit, and. Uh, I know well what I have heard from many people in UK. We didn't know what was going on. You should have told us what uh, a Brexit means. And obviously, a lot of people voted for Brexit, ignoring the exact consequences. You mentioned the uh, exit uh, consequences on the Irish border and many others like the financial services. My proposal is very simple. Now that everybody in UK fully understands what Brexit means, including the citizens, the British citizens that are in, new, in, in mainland Europe, because you have voted uh, a Brexit that will have hundreds of thousands of consequences on the British citizens that are in Europe. In my constituency, I have a lot of British citizens who are afraid of what's going on, because they say, what will happen to us? We are concerned. And you voted for these people, we ignoring them. So my proposal is now you should ask the British people, the British citizen in all Europe, the ones that are in UK and also the British citizens uh, living in Europe, what is your decision on the Brexit now that you know what it is made of? You, you should ask for a referendum. It's well, a great I'm, idea. That's it. Let, let the a great people idea, vote. But we need a long extension it, to do it. If you are asking for a referendum, so, so you want you want you us not merely to change our result, but to change our electorate to a different electorate from what we have in our normal elections. But the, these there are, are British people. Approximately one million nine hundred thousand British people. The British, if the yes, British people, one at a time. One at a time. Those, Peter Lilly first. Sorry. Let them vote. S one at a time. We, we allow under our electoral law those who've lived abroad for up to a certain number of years to vote. If they've lived abroad for a long period, they don't have the vote. Uh, that's always been the case. You now want to extend it even to people who've lived a long time abroad. That might make a small difference to the outcome. I very much doubt it. But I think the idea that we try and rig the, uh, the electorate to get a different result rig it. is uh, extraordinary. Could, we've uh, had uh, an election. These are British we've had a referendum. You, 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 At the beginning of the referendum, <laughs> all party leaders said we would respect the result. Oh, Peter now Lilly, you're what would you say to find Peter ways Lilly, what would you say to UK citizens, citizens right now? Minds? What would you say to UK citizens right now here in France who have to apply for French citizenship, who have to apply for, uh, uh, who don't know what the conditions are for applying for a residence permit? What would you tell them right now? Well, I, I have a house in France too, so I do talk to my English neighbours of whom there are a few, uh, and most of them are, are coping with that uh, perfectly well, yeah, thank they you. They are working in France. 
S Sebastian Dance, at this point no, in time. Living in France, so. but to me, it's not the main point, in fact, because well, we, we have citizens, let's say, from Switzerland who live in France and French citizens who live in Switzerland. And we know how to uh, do uh, things so that the citizens are treated properly. So there is a way. And already yes. in the UK and in France but and in other countries, the, uh, the governments uh, have taken made decisions to do that. So to me, that's not the main issue. The main issue but, is really, does the UK so want to leave the European Union? And if so, for what kind of uh, economic model, I would say? Does absolutely. it want to be fully sovereign? So that's interesting. You're so still on. asking the question, even though we're... You yes. really, you're, you're still wondering whether the UK is going to leave the European Union? Yes, because there is such a division, as this debate could uh, show, even yeah. among the Labour Party, yeah. even among the Conservative, at the family levels, that today, well, the, 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 so, the British society, in my view, is really split in, in, uh, in terms of decisions I, I, about I, I mean, remaining uh, or leaving I, I the EU. S Sebastian Dance, is there still a chance the UK I, could remain yeah, in the EU? I, yes, there is absolutely still a chance that the uh, UK could remain in the European Union. I mean, just on the Switzerland uh, example, of course, Switzerland is in Schengen, and Switzerland has these series of bilateral mm. agreements with the European exactly. Union that replicate uh, a lot of European mm. law, and they have no say. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an absurd situation. Of course, in 92, they had a referendum uh, to join the EEA, which was very narrowly rejected, and that kind of threw out the, uh, the accession uh, possibilities. But the reality, of course, is that the UK government has rejected all of the conditions that would make a Swiss-style uh, uh, Swiss uh, deal impossible. Um, but yes, I do think it is very possible that the United Kingdom remains in the European Union, because I think we could well be approaching a crunch point next week. And I think one of two things will happen. I think uh, we will either uh, ex uh, ask for a long extension, the Prime Minister will ask for a long extension, that could be granted in an emergency council meeting, a long extension for some purpose, whether that be a referendum or some other uh, process uh, to find another type of Brexit, maybe change the red lines, whatever. Um, or we could find ourselves in a situation where we have a choice between no deal and revoke. And I think in that scenario, things uh, could be very, very uh, um, heightened indeed. And I would expect, frankly, the government to fall apart because I don't think the cabinet could agree uh, to uh, sign off on a no deal. Uh, I think that you would see enormous resignations within the cabinet. And I would hope that the opposition parties would join forces to push for revoke. And in that scenario, yes, you would need some sort of process after that. You can't just revoke and pretend it never happened. You would probably need a referendum after to that, but at least we would have the time to have a, sen a sensible and calm and rational discussion about so what if, the options are. So if there are. was because a vote the of moment, no confidence, don't. would the outcome be a second referendum or would it just be a general election? Do you mean, of, sorry, well, I think if, we rev if, if the Prime Minister or a new Prime Minister, who knows, next week had to revoke uh, uh, to avoid no deal, then I, I would expect a vote of no confidence in, uh, if, it was, if it was Theresa May who did that, I would expect a vote of no confidence in her government uh, the following week. Uh, and I would expect, I, you know, this would be my prediction, that uh, you would have furious Conservative MPs who would join with Labour MPs. Uh, and you could well then see a general election. But we would at least not then have a ticking clock. We would, it, we would be in a situation where we would be able to sort out domestic politics, have a general election, test the mood of the public, and then we can decide what it is we want to do as a country. Uh, Jacques-Marie Lossian, if it does go badly wrong for Theresa May next Monday, would the EU be willing to hit the pause button? No, the problem is the following one. We have been trying to negotiate with UK for a two and a half years now. Uh, I've discussed many times with Michel Barnier. He explained, he always explained, we have been proposing all the different uh, framework to UK for exiting the EU. And obviously the most favorable one was, for instance, the Norway framework. And Mrs. May has mm. had red lines, and she refused systematically mm. all the proposals. Mm. So now everything is in the end mm. of the British government or the British people. Uh, pay attention. You cannot extend uh, without uh, strong reasons the, uh, okay. would the, the it, timeline, would it, because we have elections. The prime minister falling. Would that be a, a, a reasonable grounds for an extension? No. 
No, it would no. not. The, 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 but the, then the EU stands the risk no, no. of being blamed for pushing no, the, no. Uh, the, only... the of pushing the UK over a no deal no, Brexit no, no. cliff. Let, let, let's be clear. From from obvious reason, you can accept. We we could accept. European leaders could accept a lengthy extension only if they all say that huh? Donald Tusk and a few others. If there is a proposal, a strong proposal for mm. let's say six months. Mm. And a strong proposal for six mm. months is either a referendum or general elections, nothing else. But the current deal is the best deal that UK can obtain. So uh, the only proposal is mm. general elections or a referendum. Because if UK is still in the European Union after May 26, we have general elections on May 26. So from a legal point of view, we should have elections in UK to send uh, MPs to uh, Brussels and, and Strasbourg. Peter Lilly, we've heard a, a flurry mm. of scenarios in the last five minutes. Uh, <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. As, we, as, we, as you said, uh, between now and next Monday, a lot could happen. Uh, do you think we'll have some sort of closure by the middle end of next week? Well, we certainly will have by the by 11 o'clock on Friday the 29th, we will either have left or something very dramatic will have happened to overcome that. The likely scenario is there's a, a, no a, non, a, a, a vote on Monday which is not on the deal itself but will give a chance for all sorts of amendments which might throw up something strange. There'll be the uh, withdrawal agreement come back on Tuesday in all probability, that will be defeated. What will happen thereafter, I can't tell you. It, the Prime Minister has said she will not ask for a long uh, extension, which is a theoretical possibility. She could then go back and say, well, I failed to get it through, I need a long extension for something, a referendum, a general election, um, a renegotiation on the lines that the Labour Party is proposing or something like that. Uh, but she has said she will not. Uh, have a, asked for a long extension. Now, her, we've learnt that uh, almost nothing she says can be relied on for very long. So, conceivably, that will not turn out to be the case, though. That would be very strange if her word doesn't last even three or four days. Uh, so, in all probability, then, in that scenario, we would leave on the... at 11 o'clock on 29th of March, uh, of March uh, without a withdrawal agreement and... I hope the next thing we do next day is say, but carry it, come on, let's continue to trade without tariffs. We can agree that between oh, you gosh. and us. That still leaves all the service mm. arrangements uh, uh, to be fantasy. sorted out. But let's keep doing that for a year. That can be done under WTO um, GATT rule, uh, Article 24. <laughs> and, it, and well, it's, it's probably fantasy that they'd agree. Oh. And the well, Irish border? We would have to... No, we... Well, we've said what will happen on the Irish border, that we will not levy tariffs on the Irish border in the event of no deal. We announced that last right. week. Because everyone else is just making no, it no, up. No, sorry, it's not that a was separately different. I mean, that come was different. on. Two, uh, with, two with years it, later, excuse and we're me, still excuse saying, me, oh, we'll just carry on trading as if nothing happened. This is ridiculous. Yes. We cannot still be having this conversation no. two years later. It is pure fantasy. You cannot simply just say, we'll carry on trading. The whole point is we follow the rules because we, we are members of the European Union. You can't then say, oh, by the way, uh, if you continue to trade, you know, that'll be great, we'll just carry on, because we've decided to exit the rules that make it possible. It is so simple and so basic and I cannot believe eight days before we're supposed to leave the European Union we're still having this ridiculous this conversation. Session. Honestly, I can honestly see why the EU27 have had enough. I've had enough. Everybody's had enough. This is simply now absurd. And we've we'll got probably to stop this and we've got and, to be realistic. And well, we'll no, probably I, be talking we about it again next Monday. Of, I want to thank Sebastian Dance for joining us uh, from London. I want to thank as well uh, Peter Lilly. Fortunately we've run out of time. I want to thank Jacques-Marie Lossian and Catherine Mathieu for being with us. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.